Hello, my name is David Hart. I'm with the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey. Today I'm going to talk about water quality indicators of human impacts to the wetlands of Door County, Wisconsin. I'd like to also acknowledge my co-authors Sarah Gatsky, Mike Grimm, and Nicole Van Helden from the Nature Conservancy. Um, this uh, study uh, took place in uh, Door County, Wisconsin in the uh, Door Peninsula. Uh, the purpose of the study was to determine whether or not spring discharge to wetlands was affected by land use. Uh, we know that high nutrient uh, discharge can potentially create uh, conditions where invasive species can take hold. The uh, in general, the plant species are used to a much lower nutrient water and they're very diverse, the, the native species, but if you introduce high nutrient water, you, they can be overcome by, um, by um, invasives like cattails or uh, phragmites. Um, so then if the, we did have uh, high nutrient waters, we wanted to be able to look and see uh, what might be the source of those waters, whether it be septic systems possibly or agricultural. And you can see the six wetlands ranging from the Mink River to the north all the way down to Gardner Swamp to the south. And uh, Gardner uh, Dunes Lake was a uh, pretty heavily affected and impacted uh, wetland. They're currently dredging out Dunes Lake. And Mink River is a rather, is a ram has a Ramsar designation. It's a very, very high quality wetland. Um, th these wetlands are home to numerous uh, uh, in species, one of which is the endangered dragonfly, the Heinz emerald. There's a photo of it up in the tree. There you can see I've uh, um, circled where it is, and then this is actually what it looks like uh, close up. But there are lots of, it's just really marvelous habitat for a very diverse uh, sp range of species. Uh, we collected water samples at spring discharge to the wetland. Um, we also collected uh, some a, a couple surface water samples. And then we analyzed those for major ions, calcium, um, sodium chloride, things like that. Known for two uh, nutrients here, uh, nitrate and phosphorus. Uh, then we also looked at pharmaceuticals and personal care products. Uh, that's things like caffeine things like um, artificial sweeteners. And then we also looked at uh, pesticides uh, for neonicotinoids. The PPCPs are kind of a stand-in for residential land use, and the pesticides uh, would be stand-ins uh, for agricultural uh, land use. We collected the samples in fall of 2017, mid-winter 2018 spring melt, uh, 2018 and then early summer 2018 to capture the water variation, uh, kind of the different uh, parts of the recharge and um, a lack of recharge in the water year. Here's a, a, photo, a couple photos of the sampling method. We use dedicated tubing at each site with a peristaltic pump. and We always uh, pulled from the same spring vent and uh, we uh, pumped until field parameters such as uh, conductivity, dissolved oxygen, pH, and temperature stabilized. This is the same site shown down here. This is the same cedar tree. You can see the vastly different conditions. This is about 60 or 70 Fahrenheit, and here it's 3 degrees Fahrenheit. So a summary of the, um, of the impacts of, what we, of the water quality. Um, I just I chose several of the uh, analytes here. Um, you can see chloride, uh, enterococci, bacteria, nitrate, phosphorus, pharmaceuticals, and personal care products, and pesticides. And then located, and then here's the all of the sites where we uh, did the collections. Uh, chloride, enterococci, nitrate, and phosphorus are all averages over the four uh, sample times, and these are uh, percent detects. We did that because there were a lot of no detects, and this provided more sensitivity um, for our analysis. So those were the impacts. We also, what we wanted to do was tie that water quality, see if there was a, a correlation of that water quality 
to land use. And so we took the uh, uh, groundwater flow models developed by uh, Mike Cobb and Ken Bradbury. Uh, and uh, for example, here's an outline of the contributing zone or zone of contribution to the Mink River estuary. This is for the entire estuary. However, then we wanted to focus into the spring discharge. So here's one of our um, locations. Uh, we call it Big Spring, Mink River Big Spring. And here's the contributing zone associated with just that spring. Uh, we also had another spring that we sampled in the Mink River estuary wetland, and that we called that Davis Spring. And so here's the zone of contribution for Davis Spring. You can, we pulled um, land use data or, uh, from uh, the USDA CropScape. Um, here it is shown for the year 2017. And then uh, we got uh, the residential um, housing from the Door County planning. And you can see that's shown by the dots. So what we then did is this will allow us to identify the land use within these contributing zones to each spring. We can identify the uh, housing density because we can know the area of this um, contributing zone. We can also know the percent in cropland or percent in corn. And then that's what uh, shown here on the next slide where we have for each of the, the contributing zone for each of these spring discharge areas, we have the residential density per square mile. You can see that um, Davis Spring is pretty high. The ridges uh, where you, I showed the photos of the sampling is also pretty high. Um, percent cropland is high in um, Pile Creek and then also around Dunes Lake. Um, and similar with corn is also high around Dunes Lake. This is a table of uh, correlation coefficients between our uh, different variables uh, so, for example, we have uh, one variable residences per square mile, corn, percent in corn, percent in cropland. And these may, first four may be our drivers. These last ones are maybe our indicators of uh, poor uh, or uh, water quality. Um, if, if we saw chloride or nitrate in high concentrations, that would be poor water quality. And so there repeated in the columns, repeated in the rows. So for example, if we wanted to look at correlation between residences, we would start with our residences column. We can see that uh, high residence value is, co is inversely correlated with cropland. So if we have a lot of houses on in our contributing zone, we would have few um, f less in cropland. And so, but then the other thing we can see is uh, high residential density corresponds to higher phosphorus discharging to the springs and corresponds to higher um, pharmaceuticals and personal care products discharging to the springs. Um, and so you can see the, um, the, the correlation coefficient color is indicated in this table here. The value in parentheses is the um, p-value, the significance of, of the measurement, so you can decide um, whether or not the, it's worth it. So we can see that residences are positively correlated to high phosphorus and high human indicators. If we look at corn, a uh, percentage of the contributing zone for a spring in corn, we can see that it's highly correlated with cropland, which we might expect, but it's also very highly correlated with nitrate, and it's highly correlated with egg indicators, those pesticide detection of egg indicators, those pesticides, etc. So from this, then we know that if we have a high percentage of our ZOC in corn, we're going to have more likely to have high nitrate and more likely to see pesticides discharging. Cropland is similar to corn, slightly higher uh, egg indicator uh, probability and a little bit lower nitrate probability. So if we just look at two, two of these variables, nitrate versus um, percent of the contributing zone, zone of contribution in corn, we can see that we um, have our, here's the equation of our fit. We can see that we, as we increase um, percent corn as shown on the x-axis, we see an increase in nitrate on the y-axis. 
this uh, point here with this Dunes Lake West Spring, spring number three, is a bit of an outlier. If we remove it, we probably end up with something a little more reasonable. Um, um, and so this, we, we may want to throw this out. If we do that, we end up with a, a lower value. Um, and so if we put everything in 100% corn in the contributing zone, we'd end up at 21 milligrams per liter of nitrate. Um, it's so we we suspect that this is indeed an outlier and may be associated with a feedlot located within the contributing zone um, that where um, manure and other things are draining directly into a swallet located near the feedlot. Um, here's phosphorus versus residential density. Remember again that that had a pretty good strong positive correlation. Here's the equation of that and um, here's the the data uh, plotting up for for your um, so that you can see the spread in it um, and so if we put in this predicts if we put in 3.2 acre lots we'd have 200 residences per square mile and or and so then we would end up with a fairly high um, phosphorus load through the groundwater this isn't saying anything about surface water it's only through the groundwater and so our conclusions is land use and spring water quality are linked. Nitrate and spring water is positively correlated to corn and pesticide. Phosphorus in spring discharge is positively correlated to housing density, pharmaceuticals, and personal care products. So that I will ask if there are any questions. Um, this uh, full report is available from the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey you can download it from our website. And this is uh, just an example, uh, some doing, us doing some field work um, at uh, Pile Creek. That's Pete Chase, Sarah Gatsky, and Shushmita Latlakar. Thank you.